Hey there, guys. Before we got the podcast started, I just wanted to let you know that I'm a licensed real estate agent in the state of Rhode Island and New Hampshire. In New Hampshire, I'm part of the Dow Group, the number one team in the state. So if you have any interest in purchasing or selling real estate, feel free to give me a buzz at 401-487-4477. Thanks, guys, and enjoy the episode. Knowledge is Power is where you come to hear people's life experiences to learn from. So without further ado, let's roll the intro. Stay hungry, stay foolish. We choose to go to the moon in this decade and do the other thing, not because they are easy, but because they are hard. I have a dream. We'll one day live in a nation where they will not be judged by the color of their skin, but by the content of their character. Welcome back to the Knowledge is Power podcast. This is your host, Max Willett. And man, it's been a while, November of last year, but I'm excited to get back into it. And I could not be more excited to have on this great guest. So if you could go ahead and introduce yourself, that would be great. Sure. Yeah. My name is Nate Edwardson, um, YouTube creator, mainly in the golf space, fitness space before. And yeah, play a lot of golf, make a lot of videos. Pretty much my life. Work out a little bit. That's uh, that's that's me. Great. Yeah. Um, I love golf. Not that great at it myself. Just uh, had a pretty rough round on Friday. Um, but uh, it's such a great game, and it's ever evolving, especially recently, and sort of the space that you're involved with. So, but before we get into that, uh, Nate, let's hear your life story and how you ended up becoming a content creator for golf on YouTube. Sure. Yeah. Um, I didn't really do any like video or anything growing up. I definitely wasn't like into filmmaking. <clears throat> didn't really know much about it. It was my I think, third year of university, 2017 or so. Um, I just found Casey Neistat on YouTube, who was daily vlogging at the time. And I had really not known that YouTube was like anything other than like cat videos and epic meal time before. Like I really didn't know there were like creators on the platform it's, it really wasn't the same as it was even that you know short whatever it was like eight seven eight years ago but something really intrigued me about it um i had always kind of felt like i had a bit of a creative void but i was never good at any of the traditional creative pursuits that you get taught in school like you know theater or art or singing or dancing like none of those things really worked for me but i was always pretty good at speaking and I was very like people focused. So something about like communicating a message over this medium just kind of like made sense. And I enjoyed Casey's vlogs were like, they were daily vlogs, but they were like, he was trying to really like tell you a story throughout his day. And that like level of like visual storytelling clicked. And so I had no experience in it, but I just was like, I want to start doing this. So literally like, I think I watched his whole vlog series for a few months, like watched through all of them, got inspired. It's like, I want to do this. So picked up my iPhone. I shot my first vlog vertically because I didn't realize you had to turn it horizontal to get rid of the black bars. So my entire first vlog is shot vertically with black bars on both sides. Shot it on my iPhone, taught myself how to edit it in iMovie, shopped it together. It was literally just like a day in my life, kind of like a daily vlog. I was, at the, <laughs> excuse me, at the time, I was going to school full time and I was working full time. So it was literally just like me waking up, getting dressed, going to school. How long ago was this? Lapsed. This was 2017. Okay. Um, You know, going to work. I didn't film anything at work that I filmed after. So it was literally just like the gaps in my day. And it was like, obviously, like the worst content ever. But it was like my way of like, you know, expressing this like creative, like, I don't know, build up. I feel like I had for a while. And so it slowly evolved. I ended up making a video every other day for like a hundred days. And then at the hundred day mark, I decided I wanted to try daily. So then I started shooting and editing and uploading a video every single day. I did that for a hundred days. Then after that, I took a break and I was like, okay, I'm going to learn how to make better videos. Like, so I started working, offering up my services even though i still didn't really know what i was doing as a videographer just on like craigslist and whatever got some videography jobs ended up getting a job at the time i was coaching full-time at a crossfit gym while i was going to school 
and so I ended up getting a job offer from a gym in Ottawa. Um, I was in Halifax at the time and they offered for me to come work and coach 50% of my hours and then create content for them. The other 50%. So it was like my first real like job opportunity that involved creating content. It was really cool. I went down there. They gave me like full creative direction over all their stuff. So I created a blog series for them on YouTube. I created a podcast for them. And then I did a bunch of their social stuff. And I definitely realized that I skewed towards the um, YouTube side of things, the long form video, but I still needed to pay the bills. This job was paying basically nothing. It was like my first job out of school. So I, I still wasn't making enough money. So I ended up starting a side business where I like branded myself as like a social media director. And I actually ended up getting like some pretty sizable clients, like not sizable in terms of they were big, but just like pretty decent sized contracts where I all of a sudden was making more money doing that than I was in my actual job. And so I worked as like a social media director or whatever you want to call it for two or three companies creating their social media stuff. Realized that I just hated that. Like that was not for me. Um, I really like the YouTube stuff. Like I said, I ended up getting a couple freelance opportunities with some big creators in the fitness space at the time. So I quit my job. <laughs> I traveled for like six to seven months, um, around the world filming with these people. And after about six, seven months of that, I also realized that I only like making videos when they're videos I want to make. I don't like making videos for other people. I'm not an editor. I'm not a videographer. I don't enjoy that. I enjoy making the content I want to make or at least the content that comes straight from my creation. I'll kind of double back to that in a second as to where I'm at now. But um, anyway, so that was a moment for me. But thankfully, because of, you know, working for these creators for so long, I made a bunch of connections in the fitness space, which is, this was before I'd ever picked up a golf club. So at this point, I'd still never picked up a golf club. I didn't even really know what golf was. Growing up in Ottawa, Ontario, Canada, literally, it was like a couple of buddies, grandpas that golfed. Like nobody mm -hmm. golfed, none of my friends. <clears throat> It was, it was not a thing. And so anyways, I was in the fitness space, had made these connections. So I had this idea to do like a long form documentarian series about CrossFit athletes and like a real day in their life. So I reached out to a couple, got some opportunities and um, decided to take those. So booked a couple flights um, on like the last couple bucks I had from all the videography jobs. Luckily, that series, like looking back on it now, I really bet my entire life on it because I had, I was like maybe 23, 24. I had no other job and I never made a cent off YouTube. But for some reason, I believe that this series was going to be it. So I traveled out, I made these videos. Thankfully, it worked. Um, the first one got like 50,000 views. The second one got like 100,000 views. Like it was very similar to my golf channel story. So that worked. And then... <clears throat> I made those for probably like two or three months. Then COVID hit. I was kind of forced to like reinvent the content because I couldn't travel anymore. So I started making vlogs and I ended up vlogging in CrossFit for basically since September 2019 until December of 2022, I think. And then, <clears throat> so I was doing it full time. But in that little window, it was actually August of 2021. Um, one of my buddies during the pandemic took me to a pitch and put here in Vancouver which is essentially like a mini par three course. And I had never golfed before other than one gym class where we went on a field trip to a driving range when I was kids. Um, but we played it. It was 18 holes. Again, just like a wedge and a putter. Literally played it. I don't know if it was because of COVID or because I was kind of transitioning out of CrossFit and I wasn't as interested in that anymore. But I ended up going back the next day and you can buy, it's like a city course. So you could buy a membership to the pitch and putt. It was 80 bucks for the month and you could play unlimitedly. So literally went back the next day, bought the membership and I played for like 50 days in a row. Like I went there every single day for like 50 days and just played 18 hole pitch and putt. And that's how I fell in love with golf. So my golf passion was kind of growing. December of 22 hit, uh, the good, good news broke about them kind of like, you know, the Grant Michael leaving. And I remember I was just on a walk with my wife and our dogs and I was just kind of like, Hey, like, this doesn't make any sense to me. Like I've been in this YouTube thing forever. Like, why would they leave that? I had all these questions and she was like, well, maybe like other people would have these questions. Like maybe like you should make a video about this. And I was like, yeah, I don't know. I'm not going to make it on the fitness channel. Cause it's like not related. She's like, well, why don't you just make a TikTok?" I was like, okay. So I made this like one minute TikTok of me just like expressing my 
questions on why Grant left as a creator. Long story short, that TikTok in 24 hours got like half a million views. It's like, wow. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> okay. So the next day I was like, all right, if it did this good on TikTok, surely it's got to do good on YouTube. So then I basically right. made the same video again, posted it on a channel with zero views, zero subscribers, went to bed that night. It had like seven views because like you post a brand, a video on a brand new channel. It's going to take a lot of time if it's going to break through to break through. Woke up the next morning. It had like 7,000 views. Wow. Like, okay. All right. Cool. But again, I kind of was like, oh, okay, sweet. Like that's, it. you know, at the time I was maybe getting between like five to 20,000 views a video. I'd have the odd, like. 40 or 50,000 view video. On the and that was on a different channel. That was on a different uploaded. channel. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. That was on my CrossFit channel. But so I see 7,000. I'm like, surely that's as good as it's going to get. That's awesome. Like this one video worked. Maybe I'll make more. Maybe I won't. Whatever. So anyway, I went on with my day. Later that day, I went to log out of the golf channel, log into my CrossFit channel to post something. But right before I logged out, I noticed I had like a couple hundred subscribers. I was like, what? How did that happen? So I checked back on the video and then like, 24, 36 hours, it had gone, well, in like 12 hours, it had gone from the 7,000 to like 52,000 views. And I was wow. like, whoa. So yeah. like <clears throat> something just like a light went off in my brain. And I was just like, I've got something. Like I've got something right. here. So it, just being the personality I am, if you can't tell from the story already, is that I'm a very like all in kind of guy. And the moment, like, my passion for fitness, my, my passion for fitness has never waned. I, I still exercise, you know, every day. I love fitness. It's a huge passion. But my passion for competitive CrossFit had died off. Like I was mm -hmm. not that interested in it anymore. I was kind of just doing it because it was my job, but I wasn't that stoked on it. My actual passion was golf at that time. And it really transitioned. So you give me one video that had done that in the space I actually cared the most about. Um, I was like, I'm in. So yeah, then I just started making videos, you know, commentary videos or whatever. And obviously it was really hot for a while because the Grant Micah thing. I kind of thought in January of 23, when Good Good was announcing their like new deal, which was the Callaway deal and Grant Micah mm -hmm. had gone off on their own. I kind of thought surely this, all this drama is going to die off and I'm probably not going to have a channel, but I'm like, maybe I'll be able to figure it out. Maybe I'll start posting course videos, whatever. And lo and behold, it's like two years later now. And like, I've had a channel for two years in this space, mainly yeah. posting commentary videos. I am starting to post more course content. I just announced yesterday that I'm joining mm -hmm. a pretty much like the elite amateur golf tour in Canada. So I'm going to be playing 16 weeks, 16 events, culminating in a tour championship and then trying to qualify for the Canadian amateur this year. Um, and I want to document the whole thing because competitive golf is really a huge part of my life now. Um. But, uh, but yeah, anyway, yeah. so yeah, I think that's kind of, I mean, and then there's like a little nuanced stuff within the golf channel, like getting sponsored mm. by Good Good and all that kind of stuff, right. but I'll let you kind of ask about that. Yeah, so, there's a, yeah, there's a lot of things to unpack there. There's a lot to unpack, yeah. And um, I'll tell you, probably my listeners don't really know a lot about the YouTube golf scene. I personally do because I watch it and I love it and yeah. it's just a lot of great content. And so, but let's, let's backtrack a little bit. So you first started uploading on YouTube in 2017. Correct. Okay. All right. 2017. Okay. Now let's explain quickly what is good, good, right? Because mm -hmm. you mentioned Grant and Micah. I know who they are, but a lot mm -hmm. of people don't. So what is good, good? Good, good is a group of now it's like a lot, but I would say even still, it's a group of like five core members um, that form this golf YouTube channel that posts content, they really were the first ones to come out and do big group style content. Um, mm -hmm. So they were kind of innovators, whereas before it, you know, YouTube golf at first was a lot of teaching content. Then you saw people like Rich Shields, Peter Finch break out and they were doing on course content, but it was a bit more, you know, one V one kind of serious stroke play, whatever. It wasn't like the craziest challenges, but Google came out with this big group format where you have a bunch of different individuals of different skills, which is inherently interesting. Mm -hmm. And then they started doing all of these really unique challenges that people hadn't seen before. And they essentially exploded really quick. It was during the pandemic, um, sort of off the back of uh, Garrett GM golf, who was really the first of them right. to build a following. And he was kind of the, I guess maybe like in part, the, the idea behind it was like, you know, he was, he was one of the core founding members. 
and he had the success at the time. So it was like, I think, you know, he definitely saw the potential for this to work and he was correct. And Matt Kendrick and everyone else involved was correct. And they blew up really quick. And now, now they're just a brand. They're just a right. powerhouse brand in the YouTube golf space. They have their channel. Yeah. But they've, you know, done broadcast stuff. They have products that are in PGA tour, Superstores, golf galaxy mm-hmm. that are, you know, they're sponsoring athletes all over over in the golf space right um, including like pga tour golfers now and like luke clanton who's technically still an amateur but he's basically a pga tour golfer um, right so yeah it's uh they're they're powerful yeah now. so good good is a really interesting brand and covid saved in my opinion sort of saved golf as an industry because i know uh i was looking at some numbers and especially during covid golf was on a real downturn in, st- in terms of a lot of the popularity of golf courses, peep the number of people golfing and COVID uh, helped golf. I know that's weird to sound, say that COVID helped something, but people sure. didn't want to be tied up inside and a lot more people started golfing. And that's exactly when you saw, yeah, exactly. That's exactly saw. So he pointed that himself if you're listening, but um, <laughs> uh, people started to, and that, that transitioned into online too. People were interested Ooh more people started to go on YouTube to want to watch mm-hmm. golf t- content. And, um, yeah, I mean, I know Rick Shields. I probably watched videos when I was in high school of him, but, um, I remember sort of discovering, uh, GM golf from the Sunday matches between him and Micah. And mm-hmm. I thought that was, a uh, I, I loved watching those. I remember looking forward cause Yeah, it was like every Sunday at like six o'clock or something, they would upload them. And it was something that I look forward to watching every week. And uh, because it was different, you really didn't see a lot of it. And especially because they were my age. I mean, Micah's a few years older than me, but Garrett, Mm -hmm. I think is only a year older than me, you know, so it's cool to see guys that are similar in age to me be successful online playing golf. I mean, and, and I like to compare good, good to sort of like the Guggen squad of golf. If you're familiar with the Guggen squad, it's very similar. And I know Matt Kendrick used to be, who's a CEO of good, good used to be with Guggen, which was a really interesting transition. I remember watching him come up on one of the videos. I was like, wait, I thought he was with Guggen squad. And now all of a sudden he was with good, good. And that was something that was interesting. I don't know how that worked on the back end, (laughs) you know, but, um, Cause I had been, I'm into fishing and hunting and things like that. And, um, so I had been a fan of Guggen before good, good. And they obviously mm-hmm. were around before then, but for those of you that don't really know good, good, or might know Guggen, it's sort of the same thing, just golf. <laughs> and then I guess that sort of steps back to those video gamers. Um, what was the group called, you know, like a few years ago, I don't remember what the group was called, but do you know what I'm referring to? There was a group, they all had a house together and, um, I'm sure somebody listening knows what I'm talking about, but, um, it sort of starts back like that. Uh, you know, sort of, you have these communal groups that do this certain form of content together. And yeah, it's been incredible to see what good, good has accomplished. You know, they have putters, they have golf balls, they have, hats apparel as you can see nate's wearing it right now i don't have any good good apparel putter covers yeah (laughs) but um i don't have any apparel but i definitely got to get some for next year maybe it'll help me play better um (laughs) works for me yes (laughs) but what's crazy to me is you said you didn't really start golfing until 2020 and now 2021 and now you're going to try to compete on the Canadian amateur tour. I, I watched that video last night mm-hmm. as soon as you uploaded it and was like, well, what's this annou- announcement going to be? And um, I watched the video, great video, just to prove that I watch it. You shot two under, right? There you go. All right. <laughs> yep. Yep. Um, so yeah, explain sort of how that happened. You know, how do you start something literally three years ago to now being able to compete at a semi-professional level? Yeah. Thank you. Yeah. I mean, it's, it's definitely crazy when you put it like that. Like to me, it's like, you know, it's like anything, like when you're, when you're involved the day to day, right. Like it, it's like having a kid, like I'm sure, like I don't have a kid, but like you watch them grow every single day. 
and you right. see the like little tiny growth so it doesn't seem as dramatic but then when you go to like your you know your brother's house who hasn't seen them for six months they're like oh my goodness your kid's so big like whatever and yeah. you're kind of like oh yeah i guess they are like and you know it's kind of the same for me with golf like it feels normal because it's what i know and you know i think part of my success is i was lucky that i was able to surround myself with people who were way better than me very early so I've always felt like I suck at golf because I've always been comparing myself. Like I haven't felt like I'm I'm a, I'm a pretty confident guy. I've never actually felt like I suck, but I've always compared myself. I've always played matches against people from the beginning who were you know low single digits to scratch to plus to professional, like very very good quality players. So I was my level of what good was was much higher. So when I hear it from other people, I'm like, oh, thank you, but like I still. You know, it's like I, I'm starting to catch up, I guess, a bit to where I kind of like felt like I could be now. But um, yeah, I mean, it's 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 been a journey, man. And I think, you know, can I answer your question? Like I I grew up playing every sport in the book, which I think is mm -hmm. very helpful. I was always a natural, very naturally athletic. Um, I played every sport well. I won athlete of the year twice in high school. Um, yeah, being an athlete's always been my identity, like personally, like it's always what's um, been what I've enjoyed the most. I can't sit still. I love doing stuff, not sit still because I'm hyperactive, but I just love physical pursuits. Um, and yeah, I just, I think, you know, that coupled with the fact that I also have always just loved the grind and like, I've always right. just loved the process of trying to get better. Like the example I always give for golf is, when I was playing rugby and that's what I went to school for. Um, I was a fly half and the fly halves typically take the kicks at goal. So in football, you usually kick from at the upper, it's like straight on, like it goes back and goes forth, but in rugby, it's based on where the ball was touched down in the try zone or like the touchdown zone. Okay. That line you have to kick from. Yeah. Yeah. You have to kick them all over the field. Um, so you usually, I mean, kickers in football practice a lot but kickers in rugby it's really beneficial to practice because you have to kick from all over the place it's not just a straight shot sometimes you have to draw it sometimes you have to cut it um get it in so my favorite part of rugby was like i would go to practice and then at university everyone else would go out and party and i would just stay back at the field with the lights on and kick for like two or three hours on a friday night and like i would just put music on and like it was just the best it was the vibes and so when i found golf <clears throat> i kind of realized i'm like holy crap, like the whole development of this thing is what I enjoy the most, which is just like me alone, like on a field doing something like skilled, repetitive and trying to figure it out. And like that mm -hmm. is just, it's always been the best. And so I think that it was a huge correlate. You know, I've probably hit minimum, minimum 500 to 700 balls a week since August of 2021 when I first started. Like wow. I've, I've, I've probably never gone more than two or three days without touching a golf club in the last three years. Like it's just, you know, and a lot of that is. So that's what it day. takes to get good hit five to 600 <laughs> golf balls a week for three years. Yeah. I mean, that for sure is part of it. I, I definitely, you know, I think there's all, but there, then, then that brings a lot of other things into question. Like you can't do that in less like the other things I'm doing, which is like, you know, every single day I spend an hour minimum doing mobility and, you know, I sleep minimum eight to nine hours a night you know, I take an ice bath every single day. I, um, I train outside of golf four to six times or three to four times a week. Sorry. And you have a golf coach, right? I do have a golf course now. So that was actually yeah. what I was going to say is like, that really was like the difference. So that was about two months ago. I brought him on. I started playing in tournaments this year. I had some success. Um, but I had also had a bunch of walls that I hit for a while. I just like out of nowhere, just like started hitting the hosel left, right and center. And I like, couldn't just hit the ball at all like and um basically what that was to me is i was just like all right i could fix this myself i'm sure if i spent a couple hours at the range but there's something clearly wrong with my swing like there's something that's just like not correct and i also for being someone who's like relatively tall athletic strong ish um i never hit the ball very far and again i'm like this just doesn't make sense people way smaller than me hitting it farther um so i'm like there's definitely some inefficiencies here so uh, I just was looking around, whatever. I got lucky. I got connected with an absolute stud who I started working with. And that has been, that has been the biggest game changer ever. That's really working with him is what's really given me confidence to be like, I'm ready to like, not only pursue competitive golf, 
but pursue competitive golf at the highest level with the documented to do all these things. Like, um, yeah, it's just, it's been a huge game changer. So a lot of reps, a lot of stuff outside the gym. And then, I mean, in the last two months, getting the coach has been, I've, I've probably developed more in the last two months than I have in the last two years. Wow. <laughs> so what part of your game has improved the most after getting the coach? Whole swing. So a hundred to like 200 yards. I was always decent off the tee. So my big problem with my swing was I didn't rotate at all. So I would just kind of shift my weight to the side, but I wouldn't rotate. <clears throat> I wouldn't set the club properly. And then I would just swing basically with all my arms. I would jump and toss. And so it was like, he described it as like a very athletic movement. <laughs> like it was all based on timing. Almost like the long drive guys, how they just sort of, I mean, they rotate, but they throw their body at the ball basically. <laughs> sort of. Yeah. They were definitely, yeah. they do it you know, they were doing it much more efficiently than I was. Um, mine was really all like hands based. Like it was just feel okay. hands. Like everything was to do with my hands and my wrists. Um, so I basically just got my body out of the way enough to like flip hit ball, which okay. I could, I was very accurate for the most part. He would always say, if I woke up on the wrong side of the bed though, I was screwed because if your timing's off with a swing like that, you're just like, you can't hit the ball. And that's you know, right. <laughs> when I started trying to compress the ball a bit more, because it was very picky, my, my low point was like right behind the ball or right at the ball. So I wasn't compressing the ball. So then I tried starting to compress the ball. And that's when I started shanking it. Because if you're trying to compress the ball with no rotation, and you're coming over the top, I was swinging like seven and a half degrees left, you're just like throwing the hosel at the golf ball the whole time. Mm -hmm. So um, anyways, that was a huge, a couple of huge things you fixed. It's like having me staying grounded, not jumping, rotating, um, swinging through the ball. I'm now swinging like zero to two degrees right. And then I'm also, because of that, compressing the ball a bunch more. But what worked well out of that is my hands have always been really good because of that. So, you know, I was near a scratch golfer even with the flippy tossy swing because my short game was so good. I would miss probably like, you know, eight to 10 greens around minimum, but I can get up and down almost every time because my hands are very good. I can chip well, I can putt well. That's really all that saved me. But why I say the golf game has changed so much is because I went from, you know, being able to pretty consistently shoot, you know, maybe a 75 to now I feel like every time I go on the course, like I'm expecting to be multiples under par because I'm just hitting greens now. And I never used to hit greens. Mm. That makes a huge difference. It sounds like you have the hardest part of golf figured out. And it's the head game right here. Just like with it every other sport, you know, and that's huge. Cause I mean, I've played golf basically my whole life and I've definitely improved, but not to the point where I'm shooting around par, you know, I I'm like around a 15 handicap, you know, if yeah. I go out there and I shoot an 85, I'm happy, you know, I'm yeah, a, I'm a happy cat. Sure. I'm a happy guy. Um, but recently my game's just taken a nosedive and <laughs> I think it's because of the head game. Like for me, me, I'm a field player. Like if I feel good, I'm going to go out there and play good. But if I'm standing over the golf ball and I can't, I know this sounds weird, but feel the shot, mm -hmm. I'm going to shank it. And and that's mm -hmm. just what's been happening recently. So mm -hmm. for me, I mean, it's all a mental game and it seems like you have that figured out, you know, having confidence in yourself to be able to achieve these goals. That's, that's 90% of the battle. You know, if you don't believe that you can do it, it doesn't matter how good of an athlete you are. You're not yeah. going to be able to do it. Yeah, totally. <clears throat> Confidence is, is a huge thing. And like, I don't know, I think it's like, it's tough. Cause it's, I think there's a big difference between like true confidence and then cockiness. Yeah, confidence is like, that's I think, absolutely. I think true confidence is knowing where you're weak. Right. And like being able to ask for help and being able to, you know, like understand, like if you're trying to just overcompensate because you refuse to admit that you're not good at something or <clears throat> you need to get better at something, then you're never really going to reach that next level, you know? And like, it's even just like accepting nerves, accepting fears. Like I think part of being confident is you still get nervous. You still get scared of things, but you believe that despite all that, you're still going to be able to figure it out. Your abilities are going to be able to take over. And also, I, I firmly believe, like, I am not a Michael Jordan, Kobe Bryant. Winning is everything. I get super devastated when I win. I think a huge part, maybe it's to do with the sport, but a huge part of being good at golf is learning how to lose. Because you're going to lose a lot more times than you win. And I don't even mean lose in terms of tournaments. 
but even just shots, like learning to hit a bad shot and immediately move on from it mentally, like take what you need to learn from it. If you feel like, you know, you did something weird in your process, but being able to just immediately click off and move on is huge. And also just accepting outcomes because that then takes you to like, you know, the nerves of hitting a big shot under pressure. I'm just going to do the best I can. I'm just going to go through my process. I'm just going to hit the shot I can hit. The rest isn't up to me. And, you know, we'll see where it falls. Whereas a lot of people will get over that shot. They'll start thinking about it all. You know, that's why I like, and I'm going to be filming a lot more um, on course videos leading up to the tour and during it is because like, you know, great example. I talked about it in my video yesterday where it's like, you know, I'm getting, I'm shooting this video. I'm talking about the fact that I'm going to compete in this tour. If I go out and I shoot six over par, I kind of look like a bit of a, a joke, right? And so it's like you have that pressure, which is good because that feels like tournament pressure. And so it's learning how to feel that and then still yeah. go out and execute. You know, I wanted to, as soon as I started making those birdies, I'm like, ooh, I think I might be able to get this in the house like quite a bit under par. So then, you you know, you feel that pressure, you have those nerves, but learning how to kind of push through and execute. And so, yeah, I mean, it's it's all, I think it's all a subsect, a subsect of confidence. Um but yeah, I've always definitely been a, a decently confident guy, I think. So it helps. Yeah, absolutely. Um, yeah, so, all right. So we've talked a little bit about your game. I think it's important that we still talk about, um, you know, YouTube golf in general and the, and the changes it's making to golf. Because obviously that's what your new channel, new-ish channel sort of sur uh, surrounds itself about. So um, what do you think, like, all right. So what do you think the biggest change to the game is so far due to YouTube golf? Cause we've seen recently with um, the creator classic that, that was a, I, I mean, I think it's a pretty big hit. The views it got online. And um, I think that was pretty crazy to see a bunch of YouTubers from golf go play an event hosted by the PGA. And I'm not sure a lot mm -hmm. of people know about it, you know, casual golf fans, but for me, that's a pretty big impact on the game. Yeah, totally. I think, yeah, I mean, you hit the nail on the head for sure. The like crossover, it's, it's validating, I guess, what the, this community has been doing, mm -hmm. which is sweet. Um, I think on like a base level, I mean, I don't know. I don't know what the biggest impact would be. I, I'm guessing maybe it'd be just like giving people more ways to surround themselves with golf because, you know, if a 15 or 20 handicap who likes to go out and kind of have beers with their buddies, was looking for golf content, they're probably less likely to be drawn to, you know, Scotty Scheffler shooting seven under than they are to being watching Bob to sport shoot, you know, whatever yep. they shoot, but having a good time and being relatable and drinking whatever. So I feel like it's like, it's opened up the doors to a lot of different people, like people like me who want to to competitive golf and are, are driven to be the best they can and blah, 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 blah. Like, you know, we've always had pro golfers to look up to. But even us, we now have like Ben Hatton is one of my favorite creators right now, personally, just because, you know, I love watching his tour series. Um, it's definitely a big inspiration for me to start documenting my amateur tour series. Um, you know, just seeing him go through the grinds. I love Brian Bros for the same reason. Like I like when they're they my favorite, the more tournament serious golf stuff. I'm not a huge, you know, I'm not going to watch the 4v4s or the, you know, big group stuff like here and there maybe but for the most part i like the i like the more tournament style stuff but again that's yeah. just me but my point is is that whether you're me or whether you're the 20 handicap that likes to drink beers youtube golf has given you something that you can watch but still keep you in the golf world whereas before if you didn't like pj tour golf you were going to spend your time watching something else which would therefore probably take golf off your mind and maybe make you play less golf in general right so you know my... something i've noticed like I don't know if this is something you've been noticing too, but um, I feel like the more, I guess, serious style sort of golfing videos are having more, I don't know, want to say a comeback because I guess they were around when Rick Shields and Peter Finch were doing those sort of style videos. But like, I love watching, you know, when the Brian bros go and make a video about a PJ tour event. And mm -hmm. I love Bryson's sort of inside scoop and, yeah. you know, I don't know if you're a baseball fan and I know this guy's shrouded in controversy, but Trevor Bauer and um, Bryson DeChambeau, I feel like are very similar people in their respective games. You know, they do sort of the same thing. And uh, 
I really, really like those breakdowns of professional events and what's going through their heads. And for me, that's the most interesting style video. I I like sort of the arcade Scott style games, you know, when you get these big groups that go out. I really don't find myself drawn to good get as much anymore. I I can't really place it, but I still love their videos and what they've done for the game. I really like watching the YouTube championship with Grant, with Micah, with the Brian Bros, and um the uh Bust a Jack Golf. Uh you see Luke Kwan now is by himself. Uh, and I think I think something else we should talk about is you know the big players and i just named a few of them but um maybe we should just go into detail because i want people to learn a little bit more about youtube golf um you know who are the big players let's why don't we do a brief history of like youtube golf and how it's sort of transpired to now do you think that's a good idea <laughs> yeah i don't know how helpful it'll be because my foray into it's really only like three years old. So I yeah. really only know like the, I, I know a lot about the last three years, but before yeah. that, I'm definitely not an expert. Yeah. Well, all right. So, I mean, three years is a decent amount of time. I mean, we've seen the rise in good, good, and we've seen mm -hmm. Bob does sports come mm -hmm. onto the scene and the Brian bros have been around for a while though. Like you can go mm -hmm. back and see videos from a decade ago, basically. Yeah. And same thing with Rick Shields. I'm not, I'm not a huge follower of Peter Finch, so I don't know how long he's been uploading. Well, um, okay. So, you know, you got these guys that have been uploading for a long time and, um, I guess it's sort of transpired to more of the arcade style. I guess arcade's a good word for it. You know, it's not, you know, there's a lot of different challenges in golf, you know, in these yeah, golf would, content videos. I would say YouTube golf has, has caught up in a lot of ways to just youtube in general and yeah. if you look at what content is most successful on youtube it's challenge-based content it's mr beast videos you know it's mm -hmm. you know that style of competition um not necessarily you know the best of whatever but just average people competing for something and you know that's again what i think you good took advantage of um even bob the sports to some extent you know there's still that level of competition and interest but it's uh yeah it's just different but i agree with you that you know the more competitive style stuff is getting a bit of a resurgence like we see grant right now is the biggest solo creator really i think the biggest youtube golf creator period right now at least by you know um per video view metrics mm -hmm. and he is very much focused on more competitive style golf stuff like friendly competitive like he's not playing in tournaments right. but he's doing the the 18 hole stroke play stuff with some of the biggest names of professional golf and those right. videos are doing very well. Um, and yeah, I, I do, I do think that, you know, they're a lot, thanks to Brian bros. Um, there is an appetite for the more like serious style stuff, which again is like, you know, for me and my advice to creators all the time is like make stuff you'd want to watch. And so for me personally, the style of videos that I'm looking to create over the next you know, six months is content I tru truly would want to watch myself, which is like documenting this journey of competitive golf. Um, and I, I do think there's enough people out there that want to watch it. I, it will never be as big as what Giga does or what Bob the Sports does. Because um, I there's just 100% less people of, you know, a sub five handicap than there are people out over a five handicap. I'm not saying people over five handicap don't like to watch the more serious stuff. They definitely do, but less, less of them, you know, because mm. um, it's like, it just goes back to that relatability factor. Like if you're watching someone do something that you don't even have a hope or a prayer of doing, it's like maybe less intriguing um, naturally. But nevertheless, I do think there is a resurgence of it. So I think, I think it's at a good balance point right now. But I think we'll see a lot more development, especially from some of the biggest players like Grant, in doing things more similar to what we see outside of just the YouTube wealth space and more in the general YouTube space, i.e. Mr. Beast style videos. I think that's what's kind of the next evolution um, that we haven't seen yet. Yeah. You know, for me... I think the biggest series in YouTube golf right now is the break 50 series with Bryson yeah. DeChambeau. Yeah. I think that's the biggest Bryson's definitely actually the biggest, I guess, but, um, Grant post more. So, yes, exactly. Um, but the break 50 series, man, 
it sort of, I know this is a weird comparison, but you know, when I was in high school watching those Sunday matches with mm -hmm. Grant and Micah, I was looking forward to those videos. And now I'm looking forward to these break 50 videos that Bryson's putting out with John Daly, with Tony Romo and the big, the big player, Donald Trump, which is pretty, pretty awesome in my opinion yeah, to watch, yeah. um, you know, to, cause you never expect to see as controversial as a figure he is and a president on a YouTube video with a professional golf player breaking 50 yeah. in a scramble. <laughs> like, mm -hmm. like talk about unprecedented, you know, yeah. um, just, yeah. How he figured that out. I mean, I mean, kudos to him, but he figured it out and it was an insanely entertaining video. Um, but, uh, I mean, I don't know about you, but, where do you see that impacting the game? You know, is it for the better, for the worse, or, you know, what do you think that's doing to the game? A series like that. Do you mean like the professional game? Yeah. Like, like just like, just the game in general, because for me, it's, it's making me want to go out with one of my buddies, play the red tees and see what we can shoot. You yeah. know what I mean? So, I, I mean, think, I, I would say there's your answer, man. Like, you know, eh. I think anytime you're going to get that many eyeballs on something, it's a good thing. And like, especially the Trump video, like that went so beyond people who actually care about golf. Um, and, you know, it's a good thing. There's going to be a trickle down effect of those people, not all of them, or even a large percentage of them are going to, you know, become YouTube golf viewers. But um, <clears throat> some of them are, and, and some of them are going to, you know, maybe go pick up a golf club for the first time, which I think it's still good. I, I don't know if golf needs a ton more people at the moment. I mean, I'm sure someone yeah. in golf would probably disagree. And I don't know. I'm not claiming to know. But I, I'll, from what I hear from people who have golfed for a long time, the problem is there's too many people golfing right now. <laughs> Why, you know, courses are so booked up and uh, green fees are getting higher and higher. But, oh my gosh, yeah. you know, ultimately, hopefully that will just increase infrastructure and, you know, we'll have more courses and whatever to then meet, meet the demand. Um, but uh, no, I mean, I think, of course, it's a good thing. There's literally nothing negative you could say about it, I wouldn't think. Yeah, well, it, what's crazy is I'm from southern Rhode Island, and we have a lot of golf courses around here. And I always remember them being busy growing up, but not to the extent now. Like, you have yeah. golf courses where people are literally having to park on the street, not in the parking lot, to get into these golf courses you see good, good apparel all over the place. You see just, and it's a lot more young people. You know, I was introduced yeah. to golf through my dad and my grandmother and, you know, they're, you know, double, triple my age. I don't want to call mm -hmm. my dad old, but, <laughs> but, you know, I would go out there and it'd just be a lot of older people. And now you go yeah. there and there's a lot of young people out there. And I think it's thanks to the YouTube golf scene and, and, that impact it's had on the game, you know, it's attracted a much younger audience. And if, if it weren't for YouTube golf and COVID, I don't think we would be where we are right now. So, well, thank you very much for sitting down and talking to me today. Um, I yeah. have a couple more questions to ask you, uh, before right, we well. end the podcast. So what are your future goals for the channel? I know that, um, you had talked about doing a lot more course vlogs, but obviously we're going into the winter <laughs> and you're from Canada. So what are your plans this winter to, you know, transition yourself into the spring for golf content? I'm lucky. So I live in the one part of Canada where it actually doesn't snow and golf courses are open all year round. I know. Wow. Uh, I live in Vancouver, the Pacific Northwest. It's literally, ah, okay. Uh, maybe 50 kilometer square region 100 kilometer square region that doesn't get snow um <laughs> so yeah i'm extremely fortunate um it was not why we moved here it was, it was slight bit of reason but i wasn't making golf content when we moved here i just wanted to be able to play golf all year round but now it's worked out really well so no i'm not going to be making more golf content on course content than ever the the winter tour i announced yesterday in the video is in fact that it's a winter tour um really 16 weeks, 16 events around Vancouver. Um, hmm. I, again, I'm lucky. It's an, it's, you know, it's a <clears throat> extremely high level tour. It's a tour that was played on bad and Hadwin, and, um, uh, Nick Taylor and Adam Svensson, but it's just in Vancouver, but that's just because we are the Mecca of, you know, the, the only option for winter golf really calls the Mecca, whatever in Canada. So, um, 
yeah, I mean, we're playing a ton of golf documenting. I actually love winter golf here, although it gets, you know, wet and cold and the ball doesn't go as far. The courses are yeah. way less busy. So it's, it's yeah. a lot easier to get out. Um, and even film and stuff is easier. Uh, so yeah, I, was, I, I definitely want to document this competitive journey for sure. I, you know, the matches and stuff, like if opportunities present themselves, like I'm obviously good buddies with a lot of the, big creators and like you know it'd be fun i guess to do that but like it's it's not overly high on my list like um i do think i'd want to do it i do think they'd do well but it's definitely not i don't think what i see is like the basis of my channel i really think i'd like to build up you know the solo content first um again i would do a match you know if grant asked me to go down to florida and play a match i would do it in a heartbeat if i you know, I know I could message any of those guys and they would do it. Um, it would probably just be a matter of timing. So I might take advantage of that. But at the same time, like, again, I really, I really want to focus on this competitive golf journey for now. So, you know, I kind of see that being the basis of the content for a while. I'll obviously keep doing the new stuff, like, but there's definitely <clears throat> the less people are playing golf around the world mainly north america the less people are watching golf the fall winter is always a bit of a downtick in youtube golf in terms of like interest a bit less stuff is happening so there's just less to talk about um but when things happen i'll definitely still you know keep doing that i know it's a huge part of my voice in the space <clears throat> but yeah introducing a lot more on course content a lot more competitive golf content is definitely probably the next you know six months or so yeah i'm looking forward to it. that's crazy i you know, I think there's a definitely a stereotype of Canada just being buried in snow after the month of, of October. So most of it is. Most of it is. <laughs> I mean, I'm in Rhode Island. I mean, like I said, I'm in Rhode Island and we usually get a good amount of snow. We can still golf in like December, January. Usually it's like we get snow like end of January into February. Mm -hmm. Um, but uh man, that's pretty sweet. No golf and you get to live in a pretty scenic area. I mean, no golf, no snow, and you get to live in yeah. a pretty scenic scenic area. So yeah, but, and the uh, best part is, is that if you want snow, you can literally drive like where I used to live. I had a golf course that was five minutes from my house, and I had a ski resort that was nine minutes from my house. Because yeah. all you had to do, like you drove up a mountain to get to the golf course, and then you drove five minutes more up the mountain to get to the ski resort where there's snow. Because it's just an elevation yeah. thing for us. So Wow. Yeah. yeah. So the so, last question I end off every podcast with is, you know, if you were to leave one piece of advice to the listener, what piece of advice would that be? It can be professional, you know, personal, whatever you want it to be. It would probably be that like, and I'm thankful I haven't experienced this, but I've heard this a million times. And um, it's definitely something that I think is a cornerstone for me pursuing all the things I pursue is that like regrets suck. And, you know, looking back on your life, I don't think you ever want to really have strong what ifs. I think that's one of the worst things because you can't go back in time ever. You only have the present and it sounds cliche, but like really, really turning every, every key, opening every door and just seeing where they can take you. I'm not a goals guy. I don't have some big master plan. I never have, but I think I'm pretty good at seizing opportunities and passionately pursuing things that I'm interested in. And those are all things that I've been able to, you know, turn into stuff. And, and I think it's the easiest to be successful in things you truly love because you're going to put work in that nobody else will because you genuinely enjoy it. You know, for me with golf, I do think I'm naturally gifted and talented but i also think i probably work harder than almost anyone else just because i truly love it. not because i have some big raw raw speech every morning and i have to motivate myself or whatever there's just honestly truly nothing i would rather do with my time than practice golf like if i i wish i didn't have to sleep i wish my body didn't break down i wish i could literally practice for 12 hours a day 18 hours a day that it, truly what i want to do with my time so if you find something like that that you love that much you're going to have a greater chance of excelling. And so if you have one of those things in your life and you're kind of humming and hawing, especially if you're young, even if you're not, you know, give, give it some time, give it a year, give it two, you know, sacrifice something else in your life to allow you to, to pursue that thing. Cause worst case at the end of the day, if you try and you fail, at least you're not going to sit back and have that. What if, at least you're going to know.
Yeah, absolutely. Wow, that's a great piece of advice. And actually, do you have a caddy yet? <laughs> um, not <laughs> officially, no. I guess not. Well, I, I have a coach, but if yeah, you need one, just uh, shoot me a DM. I'll be your caddy. <laughs> If you want to fly up from Rhode Island 16 times over the next 16 weeks, you're welcome to. <laughs> you're going to pay for the flights. <laughs> <No>. <laughs> That's okay. Well, thank you so much, Nate. It's been a great conversation and I uh, really appreciate your time. Appreciate you, buddy. Thank you. All right, guys. Thanks for listening to the Knowledge of Power podcast and I will catch you in the next one. Bye.